must constantly look at things in a different way. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast was created by two physical therapists out of the desire to learn more about the different educational roles in physical therapy and healthcare and how healthcare education works by talking with educational leaders and people with different perspectives within physical therapy and across interdisciplinary lines on how education can be improved to disrupt the status quo of healthcare education. This is our journey, and thanks for listening. Are you a third-year physical therapy student that excels on tests when you have study guides, checklists, and deadlines? With all of the information available about how to prepare for the NPTE, it's easy to get disorganized and not feel prepared going into the big day. NPTE Prep Success is an online course that provides PT students easy-to-use study guides and step-by-step guidance through the NPTE preparation. To learn more, visit kylericeprep.com. Thank you again all for your continued support, and now for the show. Hey, everybody, and thanks for listening to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. This is Brandon speaking. And before we get to today's episode with Drs. Joe Donnelly and Karen McDonald, I wanted to take a moment to share the behind the scenes regarding our coverage of the PT Residency Fellowship issue. At the HET Podcast, we are committed to providing you with diverse perspectives on topics and issues that you care about. We want to inform you about the logistics we encountered when we recorded these series of interviews. You may have noticed that we have had a lack of episodes discussing Aptree's perspective on the change in regulations and fellowships and residencies. Most of our interviews have covered the program's perspective on this issue. I'm going to tell you why. First... We highly recommend that you read all of the available information on both perspectives and consider this issue from all angles. Now, we have provided some resources in our show notes for consideration, so please check those out as well. As for logistics, APTA policy requires all media, including our podcast, to coordinate interviews with board members or representatives of Aptry through the APTA public relations team. Now, over the last few months, we have been collaborating with APTA to feature an Abtree board of director on this very important topic for a podcast episode. We have a date to touch base for scheduling an interview with them in April. Hopefully, we will be able to share their viewpoint through our podcast around that date. I hope this sheds some light on our perspective and content. Now, without further ado, here's our interview with Joe and Cameron. It sounds like that... um a lot of these programs don't feel like they're being heard by Abtree. Um, what, what are some of the, why do you think that is? And what are some of the ways that you think that Abtree and programs can work together to really optimize fellowship training for the profession? Well, there is a residency fellowship group that meets with, with, with Abtree staff. Uh, look, let me just, I'll take this time to say that the Abtree staff that I've worked with have done, their, have done the very best they can to facilitate information, but they're not the decision makers. They have provided feedback. They've provided a lot more communication than we've got from attempts to communicate to the board. So that has taken place. Further to the, the commu- communication, though, it's we have asked previously to have... Uh, online meetings, virtual meetings to occur, and but they, uh, the first one was canceled and they didn't happen afterwards. Yeah, there, uh, I would agree with, with Cameron on this one. There is virtually, physically, or virtually, or in physical uh, uh, presence, no communication between the Aptree board and program directors. It is only through APTA staff that you get answers. But the Abtree board has, in my in my nine years of doing residency and fellowship training, has never reached out to me or contacted me. Not one person from the board. And I reached out to an Abtree board member uh, when this new policy came in because I thought I had a, a past relationship. And all that happened was that email got forwarded back to APTA staff, who generated the answer for me. And that is part of the problem is the lack of communication with the program directors. And, I'm, and, and I guess I'm a little biased in that. Cameron and I have been in APTA leadership and component leadership for a long time. So we are always going to fight for the greater good. 
We're not trying to get less standards. We're not trying to get less quality programs. We're trying to, to we are grassroots people. Chapter president is the hardest job within the association at the grassroots. And we both committed to being grassroots leaders to engage membership and to engage growth and development of all physical therapists and physical therapist assistants in our states. So I think there's some onus on the Aptree board to reach out to program directors who are leaders in the profession, at least at a minimum to get input. And I think that's where we, we are running into problems. Aptree has done a great job. They've done a tremendous job growing this. I mean, residency programs are growing. It's the unintended consequences of not being transparent and not communicating and getting feedback, closing the loop. I think that's where they're really missing it. They, they push this stuff out, but they never close the loop. We're thinking about implementing this. What are the unintended consequences for your program if we implement this policy? And that question is never asked. Yeah. And, you know, I'm curious because I know you guys had mentioned a lot of the implications that these changes will have from an admin, financial, and many other things too. But, you know, I'm just curious, like, how do you see if this continues to be what it is? How do you see the outlook of programs from a standpoint of, do you think that a lot of programs will actually stay with Abtree? Do you think a lot of them will leave and mostly go with AMP and IFOM standards? Will they look for a different accreditation? Like, because I don't see programs necessarily like throwing in the towel and just being willing to go out of business. Yeah, so, so I'll answer that first, uh, Brendan, because we, we, when we saw this, for my, especially for my residency part, I'm very passionate about what I do uh, uh, on a daily basis of my work and, and, and passionate about our profession. So when I, when I looked at this, I said, hmm, can, is this sustainable for the Mercer University anymore? Can we afford to keep cost shifting to residents? And so there are alternatives. And universities don't even need Aptree. We're accredited by the Southern Association of College and Schools. We can do graduate certificate programs, which would be, a, which are, would be accredited by the university and the Southern Association for College and Schools. I have avoided doing this. I have been petitioned to do this. I've avoided it because I do believe in APTA and the quality standards and the Aptree's model. But we are getting, we are at the tipping point. And what's gonna happen is if we don't pivot in a different direction, we're gonna have multiple agencies or multiple ways for new grads to get their education. And whether they choose Mercer because we're doing graduate certificate programs, or whether they choose another entity that's accredited by Abtree, or whether they choose another entity that's accredited by some other organizations or, or institutions. So I, so I think, you know, growing pains. We are at growing pains, but I do think that we need to pivot. And if we don't pivot, there's going to be multiple trains leaving the station and there will be no turning back. Joe, I think you've said that artfully. We are at a point where obviously many programs have notified APJ and Abtree that they cannot sustain under the additional new site rules or the, uh, and that the value for staying involved is not met by the demands to stay involved. We have attempted to communicate clearly and as articulately as we can for a long period of time. I have spoken personally with the Abtree board only on one time at a formalized meeting brought together at one of our national meetings. And it was, it's a difficult conversation because these are our peers and our colleagues who are doing the best they can in the situation that they are in. But there is no feedback loop, as Joe referenced. We have not placed our trust in our educators. We are attempting to place, put our trust in our regulatory process. It is not serving all the needs that we have. We are putting in front of programs potential significant and real costs to be able to continue to be accredited. To give an example of how the frustration and the way you really just can't understand the intent, for a program to go through a full accreditation visit, the maximum number of sites that will be visited is five. For a program, a hybrid program to simply sustain itself and have a normal functioning year that is of a large size, they may need 20 site visits. So why, I cannot give a rationale as to why we need to do that 
in a year that, uh, as in comparing to the highest standard level of a full accreditation study. Now, yes, they are one day offsite visits that are being proposed, but those questions have been asked, why are we doing this? And also the, why do we not accredit the mentors? What is so important about the plinth in the room? Why not give that authority to the CCCE type representative? CAPTI puts it under the ACCE, the Academic Clinical Coordinator of Education. Put that on the program directors, but we're busy chasing the next regulation. And also, a uh, question that I posed a few months ago, how do we visit the site of our traveling mentors? Our individuals who are out there who have an LLC or a private approach who visit other people's clinics and provide mentorship, where's their site? Or how about our mentors who are with professional sports teams traveling the country, where's their site? Or our mentors who do home health, we're gonna to go to the patient's houses? We haven't thought this through and we haven't looked at the feedback. The intent is very good, but the process is just not right. And we can get there, we can get there if we keep communicating, but we're now at a point where there's a large body of programs who really have tried very hard to communicate, tried very hard to be part of this, who are very close to just giving up and walking away. And when that train leaves, it's gone. And myself, Joe, we're in component leadership. We serve all our membership. We serve what we promise to the communities around us. It's very frustrating to see us making this so hard on ourselves. We talk to regulators, we talk to legislators, we talk about the quality of our post-professional education when we testify at the capitals on bills and other processes. Yes, this is very complicated, so we need to be humble about it. We need to recognize that times we'll get some things wrong, and we need to, when we hear those voices, we need to pivot and change. When membership comes to me and say, I'm sorry, we don't like what you did at the executive. We need to consider that and we need to react to that and not build a defense. Because when you're defending, you're losing. So we need to be communicating. Speaking of hybrid programs, do you, either of you know what the OMPT fellowship outcomes of hybrid, hybrid based fellowship programs are and how they compare to non hybrid programs? It has not been studied as far as we know. What we do know is that hybrid programs generate probably a larger percentage of the graduates, just simply because of scalability. So that's a question we've, that we, yes, is we don't know if there is data saying there are more complaints about hybrid programs. That has not been presented to us. That would be a rationale for potentially looking at differences, but that has not been provided. Joe? Yeah, I, I would agree. And you know, and at, at the fellowship um, training level, I don't even know if that is a good question to ask um, because Cameron and I both agree that, you know, fellowship is a status and you work hard to achieve that status and it's through advanced clinical training and mentoring. And, and I think it's a different individual that seeks out fellowship training. Um, and, and I think we just got to be careful on the questions we're asking and the questions we're studying. Um, it's kind of like the admission criteria. Is there any data to support that somebody who is residency trained or can take a multiple choice test and become an OCS versus a clinician who's worked hard and has had thousands of touches of patients and has taken advanced manual therapy courses and now wants to come in your fellowship program? We don't have any data that said one is better than the other. So why eliminate that track? from admissions, and I'm, I'll be as guilty. When we developed our fellowship program, our admission criteria was residency trained or OCS credential. We have zero applicants. So as we're looking at remodeling or redesigning our admission criteria, it's like, oh wait, we can't even pivot our program because the new standards coming out are not gonna allow that. And yet the data that's being provided is, oh, well, there's enough residency graduates now. Well, there isn't. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. There are less than 12 fellows in the state. We have 5 million people is, is the population of Atlanta, probably even more. And there's 10 fellows in this state. We have to be nimble. We have to be able to change. Yes, I will admit it was a great idea. I have graduated 55 orthopedic residents. They're all coming back to be fellows. They're all coming. They're all lining up. Well, guess what? They're not. Because of a debt load, they had to pay $8,500 for the residency program, now $10,000. The fellowship program is $15,000. It's a lot of money. 
So we have to have another way for sustainability. And if I can't increase the sustainability of my program, I will not go through reaccreditation in 2020 because I have no applicants. Yeah. And, I, and I'll have no avenue to get applicants. Yeah, no, I think it's it's very real. It's a very important point that really needs to be brought up and considered. And, you know, guys gathering that, of course, the perspective and the rationale and the intent behind the regulatory bodies, um, but also the programs as well. What do you each think are the best steps or actions that should be taking, taken to really meet the needs and mission of you know, accrediting bodies and the programs to really best advance like post-professional education, like how would, what's the best way, what are the things that we should be working on together to really make this the best educational experience for the residents to drive the profession? Uh, well, number one, I don't, I would, would highly doubt that there are bad residency or fellowship programs. There might be a couple, but you, but you can't control that. And if people, you know, it's like cheaters, cheaters cheat. People are cheating the Medicare system. We have rooms of binders because people cheat Medicare. And guess what's still happening? People are still cheating Medicare. So the cheaters are always going to cheat, and you cannot control that. But I think that people are doing their best to provide the highest quality training. And if you did a survey of residents, graduates throughout the United States, I would guarantee that over 90% of them say it was a great experience. I am the clinician I am today because of that experience. Um, and so I think we just got to keep the, the, the prize, the end game, which is influencing grassroots practice so we can transform society. That is, that is the vision. And we have got to find a way to come to a happy medium. You have to have oversight. You have to have some type of accreditation or credentialing process. But I think where we're missing the mark is in how we're unfolding new standards. In my mind, I thought standards will come out, we'll reevaluate them on a regular basis, we'll tweak them. But we're rolling standards out in 2020 or 2019, 20, and we're not gonna evaluate them for five years. Well, that's just nonsense. You know, you, you evaluate things as you roll them out. And, and the way they're rolling out things is just not manageable from a program director's perspective. And from, from my perspective, I'm the director of four programs. If you, if you survey directors across the United States, there are very few directors that are directing multiple programs because each specialty area is different and creates a little challenge. But yet our accreditation standards want everybody to be the same. And the, and the, the residents that are at higher, highest risk of having an adverse event are cardiovascular pulmonary residents. And when we went from 75 hours of education up to 300, it was frightening to them because they could barely manage the didactic information and the acuity of their patients because if they do one wrong thing, they actually could hurt somebody. So I think we just got to slow the train down, listen to the stakeholders. As I said before, we need to pivot or we're going to go in multiple directions and there will be no turning back. I, and I would, uh, I'd offer that leaders such as Joe have allowed us to be at this point and not already at the point of wondering what had happened. Like this is a, an issue that myself, Joe and others have kept in front of us, not because we wanted to, we want to move on. We want to be comfortable that we're trusted in what we do, that we have a accreditation process that learns from itself, that we are patient in enacting changes and that we are able to see that what we think is right today may not be right tomorrow, but we need time to evidence that to us. That's humility. Um, our profession, like and what, uh, what we need, it, I would ask that we recognize that every time a resident or a fellow is in clinical practice, they're already held to a statutory standard of practice under licensure. They are already held to ethical standards. They're already held under a legal consequence should they act inappropriately. We do not need to, through another layer of re regulation and accreditation, control all those actions because these are licensed professionals who already are held accountable. This is it, the, the area, like, that's why we talk to CAPTI at some times. Those individuals aren't licensed. They're not held to the statutory authority as students in practice. And we have been comfortable and for decades have had a way of overseeing through empowering program directors 
an academic uh, clinical education coordinator. So I got the initials in the wrong order. But we have given that trust and it has not backfired as far as we know. There's been a, there will be bad apples. There will be those who cheat the Medicare system, as Joe put out. But we need to look at the bigger picture. I, being active over a decade in the House, I see this goal of looking at DPT to residency to fellowship education, a pathway, the potentiality of general residencies or having an educational process that's available to all as being a reasonable goal. But how, how are we to get there if we do not have programs that have scalability, that cannot address the needs of the entire DPT student population and not currently less than 10% when it comes to the amount of residency slots being offered? So we're at a, we, we have a process here where we are rushing to set up standards, I feel, to meet external needs, but they're hurting internally. And I would like to have the ability for our school to fill all 81 DPT student slots into hybrid residency models across our program and other programs. But this requires partnerships with all of our corporations and our clinics. And they're the ones who are having now these burdens put to them. It is now the clinics and the corporations who are writing letters of concern to our national bodies. That should be a very large alarm bell because they're where people are employed. That's where the rubber meets the road. That is where the patients are actually present. So open communication, allow feedback from stakeholders, allow the profession to meet the demands of society. We treat seven to 10% of people with low back pain. Maybe part of the reason we don't see the other 93% is our profession has its bureaucracy and its regulatory barriers and its difficulties in enactment. We haven't worked out the models of care to bring more people to us who we can benefit. We're not going to work that out if we keep making a silo out of our educational process. Very true. I, I would like to just um, say that I am confident in Sharon Dunn as our president of APTA and our APTA board. I think enough attention has been brought to them about the challenges and I am 100% confident in their leadership ability to, to stop the train and they get us pivoted in the right direction. Um, I, I just think that so much has changed so too fast, unattended consequences. I think we've raised, send up the flare because we are all on the lifeboats now. It's not even, uh, we're, we can't even see land right now. Uh, but I do have confidence in, in their ability to lead us and, and to put us in the right path for success. Um, and that let this continue. Yeah. And I think first and foremost, I mean, it's just good to get information from the perspective from the programs out to people to really just understand what you guys are going through to understand what all these changes will actually result in. Because I think like you said, like you both had said, there's definitely great intent, but there's also some consequences that potentially could actually have the opposite effect that need to be considered. And you know, guys, we normally wrap each episode with this final question, and it's not necessarily a residency fellowship um, niche. I mean, this could be anything PT education. But the question is, if you could change one aspect of healthcare education, physical therapy or otherwise, which aspect would you change and how would you change it? I think I'll preface it by being the foreigner who came into education backwards after being in the clinic for a quarter decade. Is that a foreigner? Yeah, fair enough. And, I, yeah, and I, would, I would also like to second again what Joe said. Our leadership are wonderful. Their intent is great. They are doing the best they can in a very complex realm. Um, we are not intentionally creating problems. We just need to be communicating and listening and respectful of each other, and we'll get there. As to the question of what can we change, I, what I see is that something I found worked out in the Canary Islands in the early 1970s. Maybe it was the beach and the sun, who knows. But when you set up an educational expectation, you don't know what the outcome will be. You do not know what the top level of performance is. Let's not limit ourselves by saying you can only reach this standard. Let's be, a, let's be flexible and appreciate that we will develop new education while we're, while, we're, while we're in school. We'll learn new ideas and new concepts. We will rediscover old ideas. It's the humility of the process. The, we as educators 
should have it as first that we are there to help people learn, not to teach them what we know. Because what we know is very limited. But our ability to generate new knowledge should be a primary goal. Our fellowship program at Regis, I feel, has done very well because we have intentionally said it, that our goal is that every fellow in training becomes the best clinician they can be, but we honestly don't know what that looks like. We'll find out as they go through. We will give them the granular education information, we'll expose them to challenges and demands, but we'll see how they respond. That's post-professional. We have, we have a little bit more need to um, provide comfort zone in the, um, in the graduate level, because we're working towards that entry level clinician. But there are in a, there's still an art in our profession. We cannot make everything randomized trial based. We can't make everything based upon a single framework of information. We have guidelines, not rules. We're doing better with that. So be humble in knowing that we don't know what our potential fully is. Let's just not get in the way of it. And then we'll be able to meet more demands. We don't know what the next catalyst idea will be to find that 90% of the musculoskeletal population that we don't get to in, in our patient settings. It could be a student who has that idea that it can embrace it. So being not to, to, to have a constant goal to have the least possible regulation to establish the minimum standard, to have that approach, then I think we'll find a, a brighter horizon than trying to control it all. Yeah, I just think uh, from an education standpoint, I think institutions have to change the way they think about education uh, because I think that the current generations and the future generations are going to want it delivered differently. And as long as we, we are in these institutions with rigid walls and rigid ways that things have to be delivered, I'm not so sure it's sustainable. You know, people are seeking alternative ways to get their education. When we started our program at Mercer 10 years ago, um, as an eight semester program, people thought we were crazy. How could you do it in one, one less semester? And we were looking at the price point. Well, it's gonna be $10,000 less to get a DPT education and it's been very successful. Uh, we've, been, we've, we've done it intentionally and it's come very well. And now we have South College and Baylor at seven semesters. Right? So we just have to keep the options open and, 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 and how do we do it differently, more effectively? How do we reach rural America? And I think those two programs, the hybrid programs, um, may be able to do that. Are they tested yet? No, but they're thinking outside the box and delivering education in a totally different model that might be effective. We don't know. So let them go, let them do it, let them test it and try it and then say, hey, how can we do it? But I do know one thing, if if, if programs are going to look at reducing, the bottom line is going to be, how are you going to replace your revenue? Because if you go to one semester less, how are you going to replace it? Well, the way you replace it is residency education. But you yep. can't do it if you can't grow and you can't break down the walls. So, and we, the profession, need to establish those, those, those boundaries and make them big boundaries. And hold, and like I think Cameron said, if we could change the way we accredit, maybe it's the people that should be accredited, not the clinics. Because to me, I could open up my garage door, put a mat on the table. I have my hands. I have a mat. I can treat anybody. I can get some bungee cords to give them some resistance. I can do a lot of stuff. I don't need anything else to do it but my hands, my brain, and a mat. <laughs> so you're telling us, Joe, Joe, that the age of Chrome has left us behind? <laughs> you don't have to have the shiniest machine to get the referrals? Yes. 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 We are the we are our standard. We the greatest skill we have is our clinical reasoning and decision making. We need to constantly grow that. We don't know what our potential is, and that's the beauty of where we're at. And so, we our residency frameworks. Our, I my I see that vision of two year educations immediately into residencies that's stratified across the student body that embraces all of our clinical partners. So each university has a national footprint that reaches well beyond the site that they're sitting on, that allows hybrid types of education, that we trust in ourselves and our process to let that happen. We'll get there. If we try and control it, we won't. If we, we hold on too tight, it'll slip through. And so, but we have terrific leadership. The individuals who sit on our councils, in, sit on the ad board, I believe wholeheartedly are doing the very best they can in the circumstances they're given. The majority of what being done is positive and helpful. There's a few key elements, though, that are not meeting the needs of the marketplace that is our programs. And we need to have those conversations, and we'll get there. 
And I appreciate you giving us the time, m myself the time today to speak to this. I, I trust, I mean, Joe, Joe will be similar and appreciating the time given. Yep. I think so. Access to healthcare is one of the largest issues facing both providers and patients, as millions of people worldwide lack timely and affordable access to healthcare. Anywhere Healthcare, a telehealth platform, is a simple, low cost option for providers and patients that eliminates the barriers to access to all kinds of healthcare. To find out more, check out anywhere.healthcare, which is available on our show notes. And if you use the code HET in all caps when you email to sign up, you'll save 25% off the total cost. Thank you for attending class today, and we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, healthcareeducationtransformationpodcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.